This is Galatians 6, 11 through 18. Today we will close out our series in Galatians. It says this. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've been around here um, for any time, I have uh, shared my story of how I went from pursuing and desiring to be in the cockpit of a fighter jet to now standing behind a pulpit in a church. That story began with a movie called Gladiator. Anybody seen Gladiator? Okay. I don't necessarily endorse it. Um, It's pretty epic though. Uh, This movie, Gladiator, uh, my my brother and I watched when we were 12 and 13 years old, okay? And, uh, and, you know, as brothers, if you have siblings, you know how it goes, especially brothers. um, We lived to inflict as much pain on each other as possible, right? Like, that was kind of like our goal when we woke up. And so, like any teenage boys would logically do after watching this movie, we decided to, the next best thing was to uh, go outside in the front yard, grab some pipes and snow sleds, and go to war. And, uh, and so we found some cut pieces of PVC, and we went out in the, in the front yard with some circle snow sleds, and we went to battle. Um, after fighting for, with each other for a few minutes, we, uh, you know, uh, inflicting a little bit of pain on each other, I decided to bow out and go inside. My brother apparently didn't believe the emperor was yet pleased. And so uh, as I was on my way in, he threw the PVC pipe in my direction, called out to me when he realized, oh, dang, <laughs> he is, uh, he's in the path of this pipe. I turned, and this PVC pipe, now give a little, hold on, pause. My brother ended up would go on to be a, uh, a college baseball player, a pitcher, okay? So suffice it to say he won the battle, all right? Um, PVC pipe hit me, uh, struck the side of my head. Uh, it, it gave me a depressed skull fracture, cut the lining on my brain. And today, now, praise God, I'm mostly normal now. Um, today, I wear a scar on the side of my head, a mark of this moment, a moment that I regret. I know he, he certainly regrets, but the reality is each of us, maybe you've not been speared in your life, but odds are in a room like this, all of us have something that marks us, right? It's a rock that you caught in the side of the head from a sibling. It was a, a bike wreck. It's a skin knee. Whatever it is, we all have things. There are, there's these, these, these marks on us. As I was reading the end of the book of Galatians this week, this was what leapt off of the closing verses that Paul writes to this church. Paul would agree that we are all marked by something. Something has left its mark on us. Something has left an impression. Something has left an impact on us and those who know us, those around us. What are you marked by today? You see, here's why this matters. This morning, Paul is going to show us that you can actually tell a lot about what somebody worships based on the marks they bear. You can tell a lot about what someone loves, what someone goes after, what consumes someone's life based on the marks they bear. I want you to hold on to that. And so Paul closes out this book here in... uh, 
chapter 6 and verse 11 with an interesting start to the passage. He says, see with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Now, that's important because as Paul would put down ink in the New Testament, it came typically from the hand of someone else. He would have a secretary or scribe that as he would dictate, they would write down the words that he said. If you remember Paul before his conversion, he was as his own, uh, to his own, um, uh, as as he would recall his own previous life, he was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was deeply schooled in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, in the oral tradition, and in the writings of other famous Hebrew teachers and, and, and uh, Pharisaical teachers of the day. And so he, he was deeply schooled in Hebrew texts. But the Gentile world that Paul was sent into, you remember he says that Jesus commissioned him, gave him the special task to be a light unto the Gentiles. And that world was largely Greek. And so typically, many commentators believe that Paul would employ the help of another scribe, someone schooled in that dialect, in that, in, that, um, in that writing, in the writing of the day. And so he would, they would write down what he said, but not this time. Here at the end of the book, six chapters deep, in his closing arguments, he picks up the pen. And he says, look with what large letters I write to you. Now, there's been people all over the board on this. Some people believe that these large letters are attached to uh, Paul's bad eyesight that stemmed from his physical ailment he references in Galatians chapter 4. You remember Paul talked about the thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians, right? Maybe this is related. Maybe Paul has this uh, illness that is causing, remember I told you some some people believe that he's got some illness that caused a, um, his, his eyesight to deteriorate. And so maybe the large letters that he writes is the way that they're describing his bad handwriting. Right? He's like, look at the bad handwriting I have for you. That's not what this is about. In fact, you can speculate, and many do, on what's causing the large letters. But they're missing the greater point. You see, the large letters that Paul wrote with was not because his eyesight was bad. It was because he was trying to make sure a point was heard. And at the closing of his letter, Paul is this emphatic appeal that he's making, this great appeal, this plea for the Galatians is to get the gospel right. Man, look, for 12 weeks in this sermon series, that's been the call and and really the cry from this pulpit is that this church would know the gospel. Believe it or not, you go from one church to another, and you may hear the gospel preached, and it is far from the truth of the gospel. Paul wants to make sure we don't miss the point. And so with large letters, he writes throughout the book of Galatians the truth of the gospel. For them and us to remember that we have been set free by faith in Christ. I love what one writer said. He said, Paul writes with big letters what was big to him. Paul writes with big letters what's actually big to him. And there was nothing bigger in Paul's world than that the Galatians understood the reality and the truth and the purity of the gospel in Christ. Paul wanted them to make sure that Jesus was the biggest thing in their life. Church, let me look at you for a second. What's the biggest thing in your life today? What's the biggest, loudest thing in your life? What do you think about the most? What do you spend the most time living into, giving to, serving? What's the biggest thing in your life? Paul wanted them to make sure in his own words that they would boast in nothing but the cross of Christ. Listen, to boast means to revel in something. In a literal sense, it means to make something big. And so what Paul is saying here at the end of this book, and I don't, I'm going to make sure you don't miss this, is that as we leave this room and we step into workspaces and we go to our neighborhoods and we go to the grocery store 
and we sit around tables with our family, and we sit behind closed doors alone, that we would right-size the gospel in our own life. That Jesus would be an accurate size of importance in our life. And he does this by comparing the size that the Judaizers had made the gospel. And what was big truly in their own life. And look what he says in verse 12. He says, it is those who make a good showing. He want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And only in order that they, would be, they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Paul says the biggest thing in the Judaizers' world was themselves. At the center of their orbit was themselves, their good, their glory, their goals. That was the matter of first importance to them. What about you? Your goals, your good, your glory? If you remember, the Galatians were a body of relatively new believers. Paul evangelized this area, this region of Galatia, and then he went back to his home church in Antioch where he received news about what was going down inside the walls of these churches. Remember, Galatians wasn't written to a church, but a series, a group, a collection of churches in a, in a region. And what was going down in the region was as this was a new and an impressionable body of, of, of believers in different uh, little cities that these Jewish converts, these Jewish Christians came into the church and began to apply pressure, pulling them to abandon the true gospel and to add to it the works of law. So for them, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Jesus only Jesus, it was Jesus plus. They were adding to the purity and the beauty and the glory of the doctrine of justification by faith, which was this glorious reality that we are saved by grace, through faith, alone, in Christ's work on the cross alone, not yours. However, for the Judaizers, listen to me, th this group became known as the circumcision party. And, and really what they did was they said it wasn't salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. It was salvation by equation. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus the law. And listen to me, anytime we add anything to God's gospel, what we are doing is putting ourselves in the middle of it. When we add baptism as a necessary means for justification, we elevate baptism as a necessary means for right standing with God, we are putting ourselves in the middle of that equation. When we add morality to the mix, we are putting ourselves in the middle of that equation. When we add anything, to our grounds of, of, of right standing, of salvation in Christ. What we are doing is we are standing before God, power grabbing to make ourselves a part of the equation. When the gospel in Romans is purely the power of God for salvation for those who believe. It's not those who achieve. It's those who believe. Do you believe God? Remember Abraham? He believed God and was counted righteous. It wasn't just that he believed in something. It's that he believed God and he banked his life upon that belief. Paul says that this group of Judaizers, this, those that are pressuring these new believers in Galatia in the church to add something to the gospel, were trying to make a good showing, he says, of the flesh. Now, this is an interesting phrase in Greek. Because it does not show up anywhere else in the New Testament. The only time Paul used this phrase, he, om he invented a word. And this word is closely related to the word for presentation or, or, or an act in a theater. And so what he's saying is that those who are calling for you to run back to the law and pressuring you to add something to what Jesus has done on the cross, they're not in it for you. They don't care about your eternal security. They're in it for themselves. They're trying to appear Jewish. They're trying to appear palatable to culture. They want to appear like they care about you, but they don't. They want to look like they're genuine when they're playing a part. It's a presentation. It's a play. 
And guess who's in the center light of the stage? They are. <laughs> if, see, if they could just present numbers for circumcisions from the Galatians, they would be applauded by those who sell, who, 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 in the Jewish world who were trying to say that we have to keep the law in order to be right with God. Those who were turning up heat on the church in the first century. If they could just project something that was easily swallowed by the world around them, they would escape persecution for the cross of Christ. And what this actually was, was pressure for, for circumcision, which was really just a compromise to, not, to, to avoid confrontation. And so Paul wants us to see, he wants you to see this morning, as we close out this book, that when we seek the favor of man rather than faithfulness to God, we are boasting in the flesh. It's what we're doing. When we are more concerned with what the world thinks about us, about our message, about our faith, rather than our worship of God, our boast is in the flesh. What a word of warning, of warning for the church today. In these days... See, the church cannot try to make the gospel less offensive by reducing it down to something easily swallowed by culture. When we fear man more than God, we are boasting in the flesh. We cannot elevate the opinions of the world, the approval of society, of your friends, of your neighbors, of your co-workers, over our affection for Christ, our commitment to his word. You see, in these days, what, what Paul is calling us to is Christian courage. That's what we need. Right? We, we, don't need a, we don't need a cabinet. We need Christian courage. We need God's people, saints, to have a Bible and a backbone today. It's time for the church to see what the world is. Man, just look at it. Why are we trying to conform and camouflage in order to not be comf like confronted by it? Or uneasy in the, in the midst of it. We should feel out of step. We should feel out of place. You look at the world today, it's broken. It's not happy. It's, not, it, it's confused. It's not certain. But God's people know truth. God's people have hope. Don't bow to Babylon. <laughs> Paul picks up the pen here at the end to call us to remember because of the gospel, we that are born again are not called to boast in the flesh. We've been set free from that. And look what he says, verse 14. But far be it from me to boast in anything except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. See that? For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. The only thing that counts is the reality that through the gospel, belief in Christ, we are a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, those who've placed faith in Christ, those who have believed upon a pure gospel and not try to water it down, not tried to compromise, have not tried to cave for culture around us, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Christ. Paul says, you've been set free from boasting in your flesh. Church, this is true of you if you know Jesus. You've been set free from boasting in your flesh. And you've been set free to boast in Christ. To make him the biggest and most beautiful thing in your life. Make him the thing of most importance. Make him the thing that's most compelling as people look on you. Make him the loudest thing people see as they hear you. Paul says, but far be it from me to boast in anything but the cross. It's an important phrase. In the Greek, Paul uses a tool called a double negative, which is basically the strongest way to communicate things. He leaves no room for a gap, no room for a plausible other. There's no, nothing else. It's as if he's saying, but as for me, there is no way possible for me to boast in anything other than Jesus and his cross. 
Paul says nothing else is important. Nothing else competes. Nothing else rivals. Nothing else compares. The cross was his greatest boast. That seems strange, doesn't it? Like if you really think about it, it seems strange for anyone to boast in the cross. Because the cross itself, that is, there's all kinds of, of, of weird things for people to wear today. <laughs> like, like uh, you know, culture changes quick, man. So does fashion, right? I mean, like you see things that people wear like, whoa, what is that? You know? Um, the cross around a neck of a Christian or tattooed on the arm of a believer is the strangest thing in itself. The cross was the most barbaric and cruel form of capital punishment in the ancient world. It was so cruel, in fact, that Romans would not even sentence their own citizens to such a death. The cross was cruel. The cross was barbaric. Yet Paul says he boasts in it. How? Why? (laughs) Because it's not because of the cross alone. Because on the cross alone, many of the world's worst criminals in the ancient world were killed on a cross. In fact, on two other crosses besides Jesus were thieves. Criminals, standing punishment. So it's not the cross alone that Paul boasts in, but the one who the cross held. See, the cross was his boast because Jesus was Paul's Lord. And on the cross, Jesus took the penalty for Paul's sin. This is why he could boast. This is why the cross was so big to him. Because he looked at the cross and he understood what happened there. That on the cross, Jesus took on himself the wrath of God that stood against his sin, that was rightly coming against him. And what Jesus did on the cross was turn God's wrath into delight. Look at me. If you're in Christ, the same is true for you. This is why the scripture can say there is therefore no condemnation coming for you. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's not a day coming where you're going to see the Lord, if you've placed faith in Jesus, and he's got some like harbored up animosity towards you. He wrung it out on his son. Jesus took all of the wrath and the anger that was coming against sin, and he took the full cup of it. That's what's so significant about communion. When we lift the cup corporately, and we, says, we say, remember his, his body that was broken and his blood that was poured out for you. When Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, let your will be done. And he took the full cup. What was poured out of the cup wasn't wine. Jesus wasn't doused in wine on the cross. What Jesus was doused in was the wrath of God against sin. All of it. And look at me. Not just general sin. Not just arbitrary sin. Your sin, if you know it. A particular death on a cross. Because he gave a particular atonement for those who believe him. What I mean is this. Jesus didn't give his life so that if you one day want to tap into this reserve of grace, it's yours. That's not why Christ came from the heights of heaven to put on flesh and dwell among us. That cuts the legs off the gospel and maybe why some of you don't worship like you should. When you would understand that Jesus went to the cross when he was taking a lashing, when a crown of thorns was being beat into his head, when his back was being ripped apart by a cat of nine tails, it wasn't, God, I just got to generally go and do this. No, he was taking all of that with your name on his mind. Scripture tells us that that all those who believe, their names were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world in the Lamb's blood. So think about this. This means that as Jesus is on the cross and he's sliding up and down the wooden, rugged, hewn 
beam, his back exposed, people mocking him, spitting on him. And mind you, he's sinless. He's never sinned once. He was able to take the nails. He was able to take the beating. He was able to take the punishment because he had to secure the salvation of you. This is why the cross was big to Paul. It was everything to Paul. It was everything to Paul. Because Paul understood that what happened at the cross changed everything about his life. He did no day in his life in the future, if he was to go into a town and share the gospel and lose his life doing it, you know what the worst thing would yield for him? The greatest thing imaginable. Where he would step into glory and he would know Christ as Lord. And all that was coming for him was delight and approval. And if you know Jesus, that's what's coming for you. Paul says, through the cross. The world had been crucified to me and I to the world. You see, because of the cross, the world has died to us, if you know Jesus. And we have died to the world. So why, why can we boast not in the flesh any longer? Why, doesn't it, why, isn't it our, our, why isn't the magnetic force of our life to, to boast in our flesh, but to boast in Christ? Why? Because the world doesn't hold the same place of value for you if you're in Jesus. Now, that, listen to me. That doesn't mean that sometimes doesn't feel like we don't, we don't struggle with that. Right? Like all, all the time we have, this, we have to continue to, to correct. Because there's times in our lives it's like, man, to, to satisfy my flesh in this moment feels enticing. It feels desirable. It feels right. That's what Paul talked about in Romans 7. You can go back and read that. Where he talks about this, this war that's waging in his, in his members of his body, right? This, because this side of heaven will always war against the flesh. But if you know Jesus, you've been given a new nature. Scri- the scripture says you've been made new. You are a new creation. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, what that means is before Christ, we were enslaved to the world. What it valued, we valued. Where it still steered our hearts, we went. Its opinions were our convictions. Its morals and ethics were our uh, were our standards. It mastered our mind. But through the cross, we were redeemed. United with Christ in his death, dying to the world, and being raised in a newness of life. And so as new creations, look at me, we have new convictions. As new creations, you should have a new passion. As new creations, you should have new values. And with a new value comes a new boast. There's something bigger in your life now than yourself. The world no longer holds our hearts, and its cares do not crush us anymore because it does not own us anymore. Politics, our election cycle, it's important, absolutely important. But it does not get the final word because no matter who's put in an oval office, Jesus is on his throne. Amen? Right, listen, you're, the markets of our world, everybody's dialed into what's happening with the markets. When can I afford to buy a house again? When can I refi this seven point whatever interest rate, right? Like it's, uh, it's got so many people, ter- when can I retire? Will my kids ever be able to afford anything of their own? Listen, our treasure is not in a market, it's in heaven and our security is in Christ. Our world says your corporate dreams, your ambitions, what kind of name you're making for yourself is the thing of most importance. But our hope is not found there in a corporate corner office suite. But in Christ alone. We boast in Christ, in Christ alone. If you know Jesus. Our lives are now about Jesus. Our jobs, look at me. They're about Jesus. 
Your kids are to be raised to honor Jesus. Your finances are given to you for the cause of Christ. They're for Jesus. He is the boast of our life if you're in Jesus. This is what Paul's saying. Don't be pulled back to making your life about yourself. What a sad, miserable existence that would be if everybody at the end of your life said, look how great they were. Look how much stuff they owned. Look at the cool office they got to spend more than they wanted to in. No, that, that, is, that would be a travesty. But what if, as new creations who know Jesus, new creations who know Jesus, we said, no, God has given me a platform. God has given me a vocation. God has given me a workspace. God has given me a neighborhood. God has given me a mission field. God has given me kids. God has given me a spouse. God has given me finance. God has given me amazing wealth for me. No, for Christ. And we lived our life leveraging it like we actually believe it. Paul says, live your life marked by Christ. Marked by Christ. So let me end this as I began. What about you today? What is the boast of your life? What's the boast of your life? What's the biggest and loudest thing? You want to know? Ask your kids. <laughs> I, I'm scared to ask my daughter. All right, Lottie, what am I about? Tennessee football. What am I about? What would your kids say? Honest eval. What would your kids say? Man, dad is an amazing provider. Dad has an amazing golf swing. My parents make sure I'm at every travel ball game. My parents live in a big house. My parents love Morgan Wallen. What would they say? Like, <laughs> this is the uncomfortable, but it's real. What is the boast of our lives? Paul says, here at the end of this book, this is where I wanted to close. Paul says, from now on, cause me no trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. It's as if Paul says here at the end of the book. It's my final appeal to you guys. I've said what I've said. Now you got to do something with it. I've said what I've said. Now cause me no trouble. Because Paul says with integrity, I've not just told you what's true, I've shown you what's true. I've not just told you how to live, I've showed you how to live. You know how, you know how he can say this? Because Paul could just pull his shirt up and show them the marks on his back. He can say, you see those lashes I got from being flogged for preaching the gospel? I'm marked by Christ. You see that? Wound on my knee, that's where I was run, at, run out of town. I slipped and hit a rock. I was being chased out for preaching the gospel. You see those marks on my wrist? That's where I was chained in that Philippian jail, in that prison. See, Paul's words were not just marked. His body was marked by Christ and for Christ. The word marks in this passage, he says, for I bear on my body the marks of Christ. The word marks comes from this word stigmata or star, or, or, or stars, or stars, scars. And so he had the authority to say what he said and do what he did because his body bore the, the scars. His body told a story of sacrifice, of commitment. In a real way, let me leave this to you. In a real way, Paul's body could boast about his Lord. I wonder if yours could. Maybe you've had no reason to catch a stone in the head for your beliefs. Praise God. 
although we have brothers and sisters, I don't want to always remind you in places around the world this morning who do. But could you point to the calluses on your hands from serving? Could you point to marks in your bank account from giving faithfully? Could, you, could your family point out the marks of Christ in your speech? Could your wife in your countenance? Are you marked by Christ today? Or is the only marks your life bears comfort and convenience? Selfishness. What is your boast today? You will know your boast by the marks that you bear. You will know your boast. But we will not boast in the Lord until we bow before his cross. Until we bow before his cross. Maybe you're here today and you're looking. You're looking to Jesus' work for salvation alone. Right? You're, you are looking to Jesus' work for salvation alone. You truly know him. Maybe by the work of the Spirit in you, ask God, God, would you help my life to bear the marks that this is true? God, would you help my marriage bear those marks? Would you help my speech bear those marks? Would you help my thought life bear out that mark? Would you help my commitment to the bride of Christ bear those marks? Would you help my life be marked that it, the loudest and largest thing about me be Jesus? Maybe you're here this morning and you realize, I bear no marks because I boast in myself. If you want to know what it looks like to love Christ, to know him and make him big, I'd love to talk to you about that. There's nothing fancy you have to do. There's no prayer I'm going to ask you to pray that's going to do that. It's, no, it's not a spell. It is simply faith in Jesus alone. We pray for us. Father, I love you. God, I'm so thankful for this book. I'm thankful for how it challenges us, God. I'm thankful for how it grows us, how it stretches us, what it calls us to, and what it helps us to see. Lord, my faith has been challenged and strengthened through this letter. God, I pray that my roots in doctrine and in the truth of the gospel would grow deeper still, God. That I would believe that my, my source of security, that the reason that I am right with God is not because of what Matt does for Jesus, but what Jesus did for Matt. What Christ has done on a cross, his body brutally beaten, crucified and died, laid in a tomb and three days later resurrecting and ascending to the right hand of the Father. That is my source of security. Jesus' perfection, Jesus' work, Jesus' death, and Jesus' life. Lord God, I pray if there's someone in this room that doesn't know you, God, or they've been playing the game, they've been pretending, but their life bears no marks, Lord, would you change us? God, would you shape us? God, would you shake us out of comfort, shake us out of convenience, shake us out of trying to be just as close to camouflage to culture as possible so that we don't have to have hard conversations or, or look different than our friend groups or be pushed out of social circles. God, that we would be a people compelled by the cross, that the cross would be our boast. Lord, would you do that in us and for us and through us for the sake of your son? God, I pray that you would save today, that you would grow us, and that you would shake us for your glory in this part of the county and beyond. Lord, help us to, to now stand and to worship in a moment in light of everything we've heard in these six beautiful chapters. God, will we sing like a people who believe that the cross is big and we leave here acting as though Jesus is actually Lord. God, we love you. We thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen.